So welcome. Uh, thank you so much for coming and choosing me over heavy scheduling conflicts. <laughs> um, I usually start my uh, stories with a story. And um, this story is about a cheetah. And it's actually about a question. Is it still a cheetah? And some of you might know this story by Stephanie Tolan, um, who wrote an article about the comparison between gifted students and, and cheetahs. And the story goes a little bit like this. Um, and the cheetah is very easy to recognize. Because, you know, if an animal runs like 100 kilometers an hour, it has to be a cheetah because there's only one animal that's capable of running 100 kilometers an hour. So it's very hard, easy to recognize and they've got like the dots and they've got like the claws and everything. Um, but what if we get the cheetah in a three by three square little place in a zoo? Is it still a cheetah? Because I'm not seeing him run 100 kilometers an hour. So is it still a cheetah? But we don't do that stuff anymore, right? I mean, we will put it up in a safari park. So our cheetah is in a safari park and he's just lying there doing nothing. Because one of the qualities of cheetahs is that they can lie still for three hours, not move and still be awake. <laughs> Surprisingly enough. Is it a cheetah? Well, he doesn't have a reason to move. So next day, car comes right, rum, 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 and they toss a piece of meat over the edge. And now the cheetah wakes up and he's like, oh, hmm, food. So he's Trots there, picks it up, eats it. But he's not going faster than like five kilometers an hour, so is it a cheetah? But of course, you know, this is a cheetah. Uh, we have to challenge him. It's a predator, so he needs a prey. So the next day, you know, the truck comes by again, and now it's not just a piece of meat, but now it's a rabbit that goes. And now the cheetah's like, ooh, you know, this one is mine. So he wakes up, stretches, he runs, 100 kilometers an hour. But he's going 100 kilometers an hour, and the rabbit is going five. <laughs> so he misses it, he trips, he falls, trots back, picks up the rabbit at 10 kilometers an hour and just sit under, sits under his tree and eats it. So this is the way it goes for about two years. Every day he gets his rabbit. And after a while, our cheetah knows how to like perfect his technique. So with the minimum amount of effort, with just five and a half kilometers an hour, he can go pick up the rabbit, go sit under his tree and eat it. And after two years, this beautiful day comes because in the, off in the distance, there's a gazelle. And the gazelle is the reason that a cheetah can run 100 kilometers an hour because the gazelle can run 95. And the cheetahs that didn't make that speed, they were kind of hungry. So he sees the gazelle and he wakes up. He's like, this is mine. So he's gonna go, but you know, he trips, he tears a leg because he hasn't run for two, two, <coughs> for two years. So now his leg hurts, he limps back. Picks up his rabbit, because you gotta eat something. But he's like, I'm never gonna make it. And every time he sees the gazelle in the distance, his head drops a little bit, because he's like, it's not gonna work anyway. And he picks up his rabbit, goes back to his tree. Is it still a cheetah? And could there maybe be a metaphor in this story? <laughs> and like, this is the story that spoke to me so much about the way that gifted students develop. Like how they get through the process of being able to run 100 kilometers an hour. But after all these years of just getting rabbits, they just don't know how to do it anymore and how to get them back to being that cheetah again. So a little bit more about myself. Who am I? Uh, I'm Tel Kunderink. I've done quite a number of things. Um, I started out uh, dropping out of high school myself. Uh, I went to three different high schools, um, getting kicked off of two of them. And then on my third high school, actually at the end of the high school, while I'd been tested, and I'm pretty good at anal uh, analytical thinking, it's been proven with an IQ test as well, um, I was working my Saturdays as a software programmer and a software architect, and I was failing my math exam. So that was kind of like weird to me, like how is that possible? Like uh, you can prove that there is talent there, but it doesn't come out. And that's probably something that you guys recognize as well, you know, like there is talent there, we know it, we can measure it, but somehow it's not turning into performance, it's not turning into anything, you know, that we can see in the outside world. And that's kind of become an obsession of mine. Um, I traveled around the world following all kinds of trainings, um, accelerated learning, creative problem solving, all kinds of things to figure out, like, how does the brain work and how does learning work and how can we support that? And that, in the end, turned into um, setting up full-time gifted programs. Um, I was part of a foundation, I was a board member there, who set up um, about 15 of the first full-time gifted programs in the Netherlands. And I was a trainer, supporter of those. And that turned into Novelo, where we um, started uh, training teachers across the country. And that's been going for about 10 years, and together with 15 colleagues, we've trained about 1,200 schools by now. 
Um, after a while, we set up Phoenix Talent, um, the Gifted Dropout Center, which I'll talk a bit, little bit more about today. That's one of the themes of the, the talk today. Like, what do we do? How do they come to us? And how can you prevent them from coming to us? But once they reach that point, how do you support them to get better? Um, recently, with Take On Talents, I've started going abroad. Uh, one of my books will be published with James Webb, uh, A Bright Future for Bright Minds, how the future is changing and how to support kids, and especially bright kids, to be able to deal with that future and actually support that future. Um, I set up the School of Understanding. Uh, that's two public schools in the Netherlands uh, that are kind of designed around a couple of the ideas we're talking about today, that school shouldn't just be about learning knowledge, but also about learning skills and life attitude and self-awareness and learning about what your talents are. So changing what education is about. And with Grow Eyes, we're developing software to support that. So I'm really trying to see like from all possible angles, like how to improve the school system as much as possible and support these students that, that need that support. And especially seeing the kids coming into our Give to Dropout Center like that, that really kind of brought it home for me, how much it is needed, how much some kids are still suffering in the school system and that, that we're doing a disservice to these kids. And that's not because you know, teachers are unkind or don't want to do the best, but somehow the situation and the design of the education system has been such that they don't thrive anymore. So what can we do to support them? Um, I'm going to zoom into a very specific part because I, I give presentation as well, like how can you coach your kid to get higher grades, um, which is useful to know how to do, but why focus on those grade, grades when your kid isn't happy, when he's not feeling well? Like that probably is the most important thing of all, like finding out ways to support the well-being of your kids. And because otherwise in school we could talk about diagnosis, differentiation, acceleration, like all these didactic approaches of optimizing the school system. But, you know, what is the point in that if the kid's not doing well? And as, as parents, you know, training executive functions and learning skills, how to fit in, all these skills are very useful. But again, if somebody's unhappy, what's the point? So, you know, what's the most important thing? How to support your child's well-being? And that's what we're going to talk about today. What is well-being and why might it be compromised and how do we kind of fix it? Um, in general, and that's a thing you kind of need to know about my presentations, I get an hour, um, I speak really fast because <laughs> I'm enthusiastic, but um, in these presentations, especially when I short, I tend to, to opt for stories over theories. Um, I can be really theoretical and, and say what theory it's from. That would not make for a very fun night. <laughs> uh, so know that there's always like underlying references. So in the end, we'll do Q&A. And if you want to know like what the theory is behind it, I'll, I'll send you there. But I'll usually opt for the stories and I know they're generalized. And if I give examples, I know not all gifted kids are like that. that that's fine. But it's just a way to give some examples and just spend the night in a kind of fun way as well. So this is the part where I kind of should talk about, you know, what giftedness is. Um, and you guys probably already know that, but the challenge with giftedness is there's a lot of definitions, there's zero consensus. Like the more you learn about giftedness, the, the hazier and the, the more vague the concept becomes. And it's all these different people who have a different philosophy. Like if we take the, the simplest model, you might have seen this, it's Joseph Ranzulli's model. He says, we need three things to have gifted behavior. Above average ability, creativity and task commitment. So if you only take this model, because they're a lot more complicated, if you look like at European models, you've got like the 32 interrelated factors that might or might not lead to gifted performance. Um, this is just three factors. Um, you have kind of a problem. I'm going to explain it with a, a cartoon that's kind of famous in the Netherlands. Um, so Fok and Sukke, they've got a kid and they get the report card. Uh, failing all subjects, he's got a bad attitude, disruptive behavior. Hmm, you don't think he's gifted, do you? And some of you might recognize this. This actually kind of sounds like a gifted kid if you think about it. But if we're going to link it up to this, I don't see above average ability. I don't see a positive form of creativity anyway. And task commitment is probably long gone. So if we're going to be gatekeepers with a model like this and say, you know, Mrs. 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 He's not gifted, not eligible for the gifted program. Therefore, you know, good luck for the rest of your life. Probably this is the kid that needs the gifted program more than all the others. Like if they're enthusiastic, creative and persevering, like probably they'll find their way. But if they have like the potential for all these things, but it doesn't come out anymore, like that's where we should come in to support the kids to get them back on track to be able to do that. And if we're just gonna add more factors and more different things that you need to have to be called gifted, and then have all these drop-off points like this kid can get in and this kid can't, then it just gets a little bit more complicated and probably you're not serving the kid. 
And I know why it happens, because you've got like a large system and you have to attribute funds and stuff like that. I mean, that, that's the other side that you have to manage, but you shouldn't get lost in that forest either. Um, I try to take a different view. I'm going to start with a story and then I'm going to su support it with theory. And the story starts um, at Vipassana. It's a 10-day meditation retreat I did. 10 days of 10 hours a day of meditation. Um, no speaking, vow of silence, can you imagine me there? Um, but um, one of the high points of every day was that every day at 7 p.m. you got Goenka, the guru. He would tell you stories about the life of Buddha in India and that would, would inspire you. And actually it did. And one of the stories that always stuck with me is a mother in ancient India with her three sons. And she wants to go and cook a meal, but she's lacking the earl to do so. So what do you do as a mother? You send your kid, right? So all the son, he gets a vase, he gets money, go off to the market and buy oil for me. So the kid goes to the market, he buys oil, comes back, but he trips, loses most of his oil, comes back to his mother crying, saying, mom, it's awful, I lost all my oil. His mom's like, well, it's not that bad, but she still needs more oil. So second son gets a vase, gets the money, he goes to the marketplace, he buys oil, he trips as well. Comes back home and says, mom, most awesome thing ever happened. I fell, vase is in one piece, I'm in one piece, save some of the oil too. How cool is this? His mom's like, well, it's not that cool. Um, but she still needs oil to finish her meal. So third son gets a vase, gets the money, he goes to the marketplace, he comes back, he falls as well. I think there's like a motor skill problem in the family, by the way. But um, he comes back to his mother and says, mom, I fell. Um, I'm in one piece, the vase is in one piece. I lost most of the oil, I saved some of it. Those are the facts. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back to the marketplace. I'm gonna spend one hour working for this merchant. That way I will make the money back that I lost and buy new oil and then I can come back home and then we'll have the oil that we need. And that's three ways of looking at life. The first one is the pessimist. Whatever happens, it's awful, it's terrible. You know, being gifted is a curse. The second one is the optimist. Everything is cool, you know, it's awesome, great. You know, giftedness is the biggest gift you could have. And it's either both true, neither of them are true. But I think the most functional way to look at it is the third one. It's not good or bad, but the question is, what can we do to make things better? How can we take what we're getting and improve it a little bit? And from that perspective, probably we're gonna get a little bit further. So to look at it a little bit more technically, you have two types of diagnosis. Um, if you're going to a psychologist or any kind of you know, educational psychologist, there's two types of diagnosis. One is the classifying kind, and the other is the operational kind. So classifying diagnosis, um, ask the question, what are you? And then if I know what you are, then I know what class you be belong to and what the characteristics of that cluster are. And then maybe I can give some advice on what to do with this cluster. The challenge of this is that kids don't really neatly fit into these clusters. Um, a kid might, you know, you have two kids in your classroom. One actually scores, you know, above a certain level at the, on the ADD scale and he's getting all the recommendations for that. And the kid next to him just barely is below the cutoff point. And it might be that the kids that below the cutoff point needs all the support because he doesn't know how to get through the classroom week, month, year. And the kid next to him, he did make the cutoff point, doesn't need any support because he's got great coping skills. He just figured out himself like how to deal with it. So like the clusters maybe are a hindering fact. The operational version is just wondering what's your need and how should we offer it? and then have nothing in between. It doesn't matter if you're gifted or not. If you need challenging material, we'll give it to you. If you've got social emotional problems, we should support them. So as opposed to thinking like, what box do you belong to? We should, in my opinion, be more direct in saying, you know, what are your needs and how will we meet them? And that's kind of scary. We've gone to a place as a society that we're boxing things in more and more to have objective, you know, guidelines so we all do the same. And that saves us from kind of the, the, the least competent, but it kind of hinders the most competent in providing the best care. And that's like a constant balance you're trying to make. And for me, the label is optional, only if it's functional. I'm not sure it's, if it's very functional for a kid to know if he's gifted or not. I mean, if that's necessary to get him into the program he needs, sure, then we should tell him he's gifted. But if there's inherently something functionally useful about knowing you're gifted or not, I'm not sure if that is is the case. So it has to do with the goal you're trying to reach. What are you trying to reach? And if we make the goal what is needed for happiness, 
then we could take maybe a little bit more of a direct approach. So what we're going to do is we're going to approach this from several sides. We're going to talk about what happiness and well-being is, what are the obstacles, especially for gifted kids, how do some kids go into a downward spiral that they end up at a place like a gifted dropout center and, and what to do about it. So that's the way we're going to go through. So first I want to redefine from happiness to well-being because happiness is kind of like a I don't know, I don't, re don't really like the term because it's too much like you should always be happy. And I'm not sure if that's a good goal in life, to always be happy. But we should have well-being. And sometimes you can be really sad and that can be being really well. So it's about designing well-being and supporting that. So what is needed for being and what is well-being? Um, I was really happy when I found Martin Seligman. Uh, Martin Seligman is the founder of Positive Psychology. Uh, about 15 years ago, he started a new branch of psychology when he found out that psychology as a whole, um, about 99% of the research done up until the year 2000, is aimed at what they call the disease model. So all the ways somebody can kind of be broken and how to fix them. Uh, but the tricky thing is that he found, he said, well, some people um, are not broken at all, not according to any of the categories of psychology but they're still unhappy and they're not doing well and they're not functioning well. And then we've got people who are broken in like four or five categories. They're really happy, they're functioning really well, you know, they're really contributing to society. So apparently these things aren't necessarily the same. So we should research the other side as well. What creates well-being and what makes that some people, you know, function really well. So we started positive psychology and the first question he had to answer is, what is well-being? What is happiness? Because if we want to improve it, we need to know what it is and we need to measure it. And one of the challenges he ran into as well is it's not one thing. There's not one type of happiness, but there are many. many. And in the first iteration, he came up with three, then with five. So first we're going to go to the three and then we're going to elaborate on to the five. So what are the three types of happiness? And this is the positive psychology, kind of like the, the popular version uh, done by Tony C, the founder of Zappos. Uh, the technical terms will come later again. So what he's talking about is that there are three types of happiness. The, the lowest type of happiness is rockstar happiness. And rockstar happiness is I'm getting what I want to have. I want more money, I get more money, I'm happy. You now I want a new house, I get a new house, now I'm happy. I want a new car, I get a new car, now I'm happy. So as long as I'm getting what I want, I'll get positive emotions and that's going to make me happy. There's just two challenges with this model. Um, the first one is it doesn't last for very long. Uh, they've proven it over and over again, for instance, with people who won the lottery, that within eight months of winning the lottery, your happiness is back at the baseline where it was before you won the lottery, uh, regardless of the amount of money or what you did with it. I see some of you thinking, give me the money, I'll show you a better return. <laughs> but yeah, eight months later, you know, you'll be at the same happiness level you're now. Um, the other challenge is that happiness inflation occurs. So what used to be enough to be happy isn't anymore. And for most people who doubt that, think about your first paycheck, how much you worked, how much money you got, and how happy you were. And then think about getting that amount of money for the same amount of work now. Probably it's not going to give you the same amount of happiness that the first time. Probably you need like X amount more to have the same amount of happiness, but that keeps on rising. It's never enough. It keeps on going higher and higher and higher. The challenge though is that most of our society is built around rocks our happiness. And it's based around the myth that there will be one day where you will have everything you ever wanted and then you will be permanently happy. And that day comes. The day that you have everything you ever thought you wanted and that day is called the beginning of your midlife crisis. <laughs> because <laughs> then you have everything you thought you ever wanted and you're like, where's my happiness? You know, I'm supposed to be happy now and you find out you're not. And of course you've got like the guy solution, red sports car, a new girlfriend, but then eight months later, you know, it's still the same problem. So you need to find some other way of finding happiness, a new way of finding happiness. And then you go up to a higher level, passion, flow and engagement. Passion, flow, flow you probably have heard of. Uh, it's a Hungarian psychologist called Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi, and he's done research um, into the field of flow. How come that, um, for instance, athletes can torture themselves so much? Like they can actually be physically in pain ongoing and they can be happy about it. That's not rockstar happiness, like the feeling of being, you know, completely beat down after seven hours of training. But it's being in flow, forgetting about these positive emotions, forgetting about time, forgetting about food, forgetting about everything. Why? Because you're challenged at the right level, so not too high that you get frustrated, not too low that you get bored, in an area that you care about. And if those two come together, 
then you can be happy. And this you can do your entire life. You can be 70 and the first time in your life find flow because you're doing something you care about in an area you're interested in at a reasonable challenge level. And the highest level of happiness is meaning. Knowing why you're doing something. Especially people in education probably know this. I mean, it's not that you're looking at your paycheck and you're like, wow, this is rockstar happiness. And if you're doing like your next papers that you have to correct, that's not like being in flow. But the meaning you get from having a bunch of kids that maybe weren't about to go to the place that they wanted to go to and working with them and them seeing the light and then them going to where they want to go or knowing that you really made a difference. And that can keep you going for six months. Just thinking back like, wow, you know, he's going where he wanted to go. Or I changed his life or I, I, I gave him a positive insight. So that's like meaning that you can create. And that gives this deep sensation of fulfillment and that can keep you going in the tough times. But if we're going to put this back over gifted kids, sometimes like the image becomes a little bit depressing. Um, I ask a kid, like, what is the end result of education? So if we take education, like at the end of it, what will you have? And he says, I know the answer. I calculated it. I'm like, you calculated it? Like, this is a really cynical kid. And he said, no, I calculated. I said, um, it's six containers full of paper because I calculated how many sheets a week, weeks a year, years of education, and I calculate the total amount of paperwork I'm producing is six containers. And the exchange rate is actually pretty lame because I have to hand in six containers of paper, I get one sheet of paper back, my diploma. So it's kind of like a bad exchange rate. But this shows like how cynical he was and how little meaning he saw in school. If that's the way he's gonna talk about school, that says something about the way he's experiencing. I mean, I've seen the other end of the spectrum uh, being uh, visiting at Astra. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. It's a school that's set up by Elon Musk for his kids and uh, parents of SpaceX. Like these kids, they're angry when it's a holiday and when there was a day that school couldn't you know, go through because there was something that, that came in between. They, they were like, physically unhappy about it because they got so much flow and so much meaning out of their school, they couldn't imagine that not being part of their life. Well, that's exactly the opposite of what you see in most gifted kids. Well, then the second type of happiness, flow engagement in meaning. Well, I mean, if we talk about the cheetah story, a cheetah carry, uh, catching rabbits all day, he's not going to know what flow is. And I know actually quite a substantial number of gifted kids who really just don't know what flow is. Not until they, and that's why it's so awesome that you guys start so early, because often like gifted programs will start when they're eight or nine or 10. And then when a the kid's eight and he goes into a gifted program for the first time, like that's the cheetah getting a gazelle for the first time, only having had rabbits up and down point. Like that's a huge leap that they have to make and often they have a hard time making that. And sometimes they'll resist it so much that they actually get kicked out of the program just because it doesn't seem to be working. So they drop back to the lowest type of happiness, rockstar happiness. As long as there is a carrot or a stick, I'll move. But as soon as the carrot's gone, as soon as the stick's gone, I'm not doing anything anymore. And this is actually made worse by, uh, somebody gave as a definition of intelligence, getting a maximum amount of result with a minimum amount of effort. And if you take that as a definition, getting a C is the most brilliant thing you could do in life because it keeps you from getting kicked off of school, but it means that you didn't waste a single second too much on your school getting anywhere because it's not gonna give you anything, at least not in the short term. You need a really long-term perspective of where am I finally gonna go to know that there's gonna be a difference. But in the short term, it's actually quite a smart strategy, or it seems to be a smart strategy. So this were, these were the first three types of happiness that um, Seligman came up with. They've been expanded upon with two more and that created the PERMA model. The P for positive emotions, E for engagement, the R for positive relationships. Apparently we humans have so much been built like social creatures that the act of being in uh, a good relationship with other people is inherently fulfilling. Regardless of all the other stuff, and this is something we really see with gifted kids. This is why these summer enrichment programs work so well. For kids that, that are stuck somewhere in a school that's not supporting them, then they can go to a summer program or something and that makes a difference. Or that's why they love going to school because that's, you know, that's where the kids are as crazy as I am. You know, like that, that kind of place where people can accept you. But for a positive relationship, you need somebody else to accept you for who you are when they really understand who you are. But if you're eight years old and you're thinking about life and death as the only one in your environment and you want to talk about it, nobody responds, then it's hard to build a positive relationship because you're just that weird kid that keeps doing that. And then what a lot of kids will do is play a chameleon. 
okay, I'll play the role you want me to play. I'll play, you know, what a seven-year-old would act like. But then it's not a real relationship anymore. Then I'm acting out a real relationship, but I'm not in one. And so positive emotions, engagement, relationships, meaning, and the last one's achievement. We're also hardwired to like achievement, achieving something new. And that something new might just be reaching a new level in Candy Crush Saga. You know, it's not, not like the high point of human evolution, but still it makes you happy. You get a new level, you're like, yay, I made it, like as, as random as it is. So somehow we want to have achievements. But again, as a gifted kid, that's hard because it means going beyond where you've ever been. But because you can imagine where to go so easily, it's hard to surpass what they're thinking about. And that's why they get like, a lot of disappointments in life. What I really like about having a model like this is that it kind of like makes motivation operational. Because, you know, if I'm going to say motivate somebody, you know, make somebody happy, like that's an, impo that's an impossible assignment. You cannot do that. But I can have you add to the positive emotions. Work on creating engagement and flow. Work at creating positive relationship. Create meaning. Create achievement. So, the question, of course, becomes how. That's what we're going to get into. First, we're going to go on a little tangent to the side. We talked a little bit before about not talking about classifying diagnosis, but operational diagnosis. So what are the types of challenges that gifted kids run into? What kind of different types are there? When I was running programs in these gifted schools, like the full-time gifted schools, and the kids had just come in, what you saw is that, that the program was very much knowledge-based. So we set up a program, it's a primary school, and they're going to get Chinese and philosophy and, you know, Spanish. And like they got all these ad additional subjects. And we put all these kids in there and about, you know, a quarter of the kids really happy. Like they got the content, they were sponges, they were taking it all in, they were happy campers. But then we had a second group that didn't know what to do with it. They got Spanish for the first time, they got their vocabularies, and like one of the kids started crying. And so the teacher came by and said, like, why are you crying? And he said, well, um, I'm looking at this vocabulary list. Um, I don't understand it. And that's actually an interesting look into his head. I don't understand it because he thought it was like an IQ test. If you think long enough about Spanish word, magically, you know, a, a Dutch or an English word will appear. But it's not. You just have to wrote, memorize it. But he'd never done that. He had never had something that wasn't in his head and that he had to put it in his head you know, by command. So that was actually a really shocking experience. So I was a learning skills teacher and I would work with them. I would say, you know, these are five different techniques you can use to memorize stuff. So a quarter of the kids would take that and they would run with it. And now they would be part of the first group. Now they had the skills and it's not just memorization, but also uh, summaries, taking notes, mind mapping, like all these different techniques you can have to process information. So if you teach them the skills, to deal with the content, they were fine. But then there still was a group that would get stuck because I would be teaching them memory techniques and then one kid raised his hand and said, well, um, I've got a test by the educational psychologist here and he says my memory isn't good enough to learn anything, basically. So I'm not going to try. <laughs> so now his beliefs were in the way because I've, I've, I've given memory techniques training for a long time and there's virtually nobody who cannot do it. Like it's work, I mean, definitely but everybody can memorize barring like real neurological damage. Uh, it's just knowing the right techniques and training the muscle. Um, but this kid was so convinced he couldn't do it, he wouldn't train. And because he wouldn't train, he wouldn't get the result. He would say, yeah, see, I cannot do this. So his life attitude, the way he looked at life was getting in the way. We're gonna talk later about learned helplessness, for instance. And that's the point where a kid just generally thinks like there's nothing I could do anyway to get anything to go better. And that's what some of the kids, like the gifted kids, will go into. Like they've tried really hard, they failed time and time again, they're like, this is not going to work anyway. I'm not even going to put effort into it anymore. And then we've got the twice exceptional kids that are both gifted in one area, but have severe challenges in another. Either like dyslexia or ADHD, or like they're on the autism spectrum or something like that. And that will often combine with them not learning the skills and life attitudes necessary. So that becomes like a mix. So what we're going to focus on today is that life attitude bit. Because that, I think, is the, the thing what, that kids get most stuck in. Like the education system knows pretty well how to do with the content. We're learning more about skills, like a lot of programs these days are about teaching kids studying skills and critical thinking skills and stuff like that. So that's slowly improving. But the life attitude bit is missing. 
And that, I think, is the most important thing. It's a turning point. Because if there's enough perseverance, if there's enough optimism, then a kid will find his own way. But if he doesn't have that, if he's learned helpless and he doesn't believe he can influence his life anymore, then there's no amount of skill and, and you know, knowledge that we can throw at him that's going to ever make a difference. So what does this process of getting a, becoming a dropout look like? And this is uh, an overview we made to kind of explain that somehow with gifted dropouts, people tend to think of them as binary. You've got happy kids that are gifted and you've got dropouts. <laughs> and magically, sometimes one turns into the other. But it's actually a very slow, gradual process that takes at least two and a half years where they go through all these phases of getting more and more stuck. It begins at the bottom, you know, functions completely well and below that without any coaching. Then you've got kids that get kind of stuck and if you would give them coaching, they probably would get back on track. But often we don't have time, we don't have money, we don't have the space to do that. So they drop off a little bit more. They can only part-time go to school. And because it's not officially allowed, they will self-organize it. They'll call in sick. They'll call, call in sick when they don't know how to deal with it anymore. And parents, justifiably really worried about their kids, will often support that behavior. Like he's not pulling it off five days a week in school. So I'm good with him, you know, taking sick days one or two days a week if that what, that's what gets him to the rest of the week. And that might be a good thing if that's part of a gradual process of making him go back to school. But sometimes it goes the other way. And then, you know, then they can't even process parts of the school curriculum anymore. So now they're just doing one or two subjects. Often they'll have to retake a year or stuff like that. Um, but they need a lot of coaching. And this is often where the downward spiral starts accelerating. Um, because in the next step, in a positive sense, they're still kind of hopeful about the future. These are the kids that still believe that change is possible, but only with like slow steps and a lot of external structure. Like they can't control their own life anymore. Like somebody else needs to say, now you do this, now you do this in small steps. This is where we're going to go. But even going back and now we're going to start it from the other end. Um, often they will go back all the way kind of like to the lowest point where they're at home year, year and a half, completely depressed, burned out or bore out, completely stuck, don't have any faith anymore, and actually to the point that they can only function in a socio-therapeutic environment, like a completely controlled environment that's completely safe and that makes no demands of them. And from there on, if we want to work on their recovery, we need to go through all the steps, because that's actually one of the discussions we had as well, that they're like, well, you know, fix them for us in three months. Well, it took them like three years to get here, you're not going to have them be back end of three in like three months. So first you're going to get, you're actually happy when they're just severely de demotivated. And what we usually will do is only activities within their own interest. And that's not like to pamper them, but because we're happy that they're getting out of bed. Like that's already like a good first step. And then from there on, we're going to, you know, regulate the environments a little bit more. And from there on, we can see if we can make the products a little bit bigger with indirect success. And maybe, you know, let's use some math to calculate how your robot works. You know, you're willing to do that. And then slowly we can have them be hopeful about the future again. And then we can have them take parts of the school curriculum again with a lot of coaching. And then a structured part-time setting. And then with personalized coaching, they can function in the re regular world again. But this is like a downward spiral and an upward spiral that you have to take step by step. There's almost nothing you can do to just in one step get them from one place to the other. And does this go for all students? No. Some seem to be more vulnerable. Um, two things that we see is that one is that the twice exceptional students are more vulnerable to this because there's a lot of places where they just cannot succeed in the way that people expect of them because of the mismatch. And one of the, things, the other things we see is that Joseph Ranzulli made a difference between the schoolhouse gifted and the creative producing gifted. And the schoolhouse gifted are really good at giving the right answer. Uh, so they take in a lot of information, they process it and give, a, give the right answer. The creative producing student will give a new answer. And if standardized tests hate anything, then it's new answers. <laughs> so they want to have the right answer. Um, and so these kids really don't fit into like, the standard mold of what, mold of what a stu student should be and what schools should be. So these seem to be more vulnerable. So some concepts to support that. One is the difference between healthy and unhealthy perfectionism. Um, perfectionism is one of the traits attributed to gifted kids. 
Um, I think rightfully so in some cases. But there's a big difference between healthy and unhealthy perfectionism. If you just saw like the Olympic Winter Games, like if you want to be an Olympic athlete, you have to be a perfectionist. Like how are you going to spend like three years of your life to shave off three hundredths of a second of any performance? Like you have to be crazy perfectionist to do that. But the difference between healthy and unhealthy perfectionism is that with healthy perfectionism, doing that makes you happier and improves your performance. Unhealthy perfectionism means that either it's making you really unhappy or it deteriorates your performance or both. And often it is both. But sometimes the perfectionists are the ones that do perform better, but they torture themselves in the process. So what you want to make sure is that it's healthy perfectionism. And you need a couple of life attitudes for that. So one of the things and one of the core concepts that comes back in this time and time again is learned helplessness. It's actually one of the first research done by Martin Seligman. Um, it's done, like, of course, like a lot of psychological research, you know, tormenting animals, in this case it's dogs. <laughs> and you have a dog sitting in a cage and the floor of the cage can be, you know, electrified. And obviously the dog doesn't like that. So when you electrify, you know, the cage, there's a button there. And when the dog presses the button, you know, it'll stop. And if you do that to a dog, obviously he's not happy with it, but he can manage it pretty well. But then they had a second group. And there, the electricity was turned on and off at random. And there was a button there, but it didn't do anything. So the dog would go to the button, push it, but nothing would happen. If you did that for about half an hour, then almost invariably, the dog would become learned helpless. And that means that the dog would make himself small, sit in the corner, and wait till it's over. But not just that, when you would stop the um, experiment, the dog would be, according to our own definitions that we use for humans, depressed. He would eat very little, he would sleep most of the day, he would not move anymore. Um, so he, he really was changed kind of like in his spirit and his attitude. And even if you put the dog into a cage that would be electrified where the button would work, he wouldn't do anything with it. Even if you showed him that the button worked, he still wouldn't do anything. It took a lot of training to get the dog out of learned helplessness again. And this is what you see with a number of gifted kids as well. They've got their idea of this is what I want to learn, this is what learning is like, and then they go into the school system. And that usually is a pretty painful experience, because the learning that they do by themselves voluntarily in a fun way has very little to do with the very organized, structured way that education usually makes it be. And so now they you know, hit their head, and if they've got like, bad luck with a specific teacher that either doesn't recognize their talent or actually you know, is somehow gets into a fight with these students, then they will lose every single time. And after a while they will generalize that, losing with this one teacher with, I'm losing from the school system. And there's no point in me trying anymore. There's no point in me putting energy into it anymore. So how to induce it? Uh, one small example in a classroom. Fun, right? No, learning how to induce learned helplessness. Um, one of the examples, actually, if you look it up on YouTube, you can see it, is um, a teacher that is handing out little slips of paper and um, their anagrams. And one half of the group gets anagrams that are really easily solvable. And the other one half of the group gets impossible anagrams. So there's actually no solution. But she doesn't tell them that. So she hands them out. It's actually a pretty sadistic thing. She hands them out and then she says, when you get it, like first we're going to do a three letter one. When you get it, just raise your hand and say, I'm done. So the half the group that got the easy ones, like fill it out, done. And the other half like, dude, how did you do this? And she's like, oh, no problem. We'll just go on to the next one. So the next one, same group, easy peasy. And the second group was like, like this is impossible. And they were getting visibly frustrated. But the most interesting one was the third one. They got the same five letter anagram as the third one. And 80% of the people who were in the group that got the impossible first two was not able to do the third one anymore. Because they had two very clear failing experiences which taught them there's no point in putting effort into finding the answer to the third one. And that's actually like within a five minute time frame, you could influence so much, let alone that you're actually doing this over a long period of time. Have the creative proofs and gifted, giving valid answers every single time, but outside of the scorebook. And every time he gets a message, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. So after a while, he's like, I do the things wrong. So I have no, there's no point in me trying to do them right anymore. So, and especially if they're punished for inherent behavior. 
you've got kids with ADD or a lot of energy or they, they really want to share their ideas. And if you get punished for that, that, that is like really hard because then your identity is challenged. Um, we talked already about the big jump in challenge level, having rabbits all the time and then getting a gazelle. So a lot of gifted kids that I've seen you know, have a turnover point, usually somewhere between 10 and 14, when they're going from like, kind of like easy primary middle school assignments to harder high school assignments. And, the, and some of them will actually explain, you know, I used to be gifted, but now I'm not anymore. Because now they get to a challenge level, they don't know what to do with it anymore. And especially if you combine this with disconnection, it's, it's sometimes kind of well, fatal, sounds kind of like very strong, but yeah, it can be really hard if there's nobody connected with them to guide them through the process. Like that's what made the di biggest difference for me, uh, getting a mentor that really understood me and talked with me through this process. And even though I was failing, I could have talked with him and put it into perspective. And I think even in, in Jim Webb's books, uh, in one of his books, he describes it as immunization. So the process of having somebody believe in you will immunize you to a certain degree of the things that are going to come to you later on. And the question then becomes, like, should we change the school or should we change the student or both? And 100 years ago, the answer was really easy. You know, the student, student needs to change. School is perfect. So the only thing that can happen is that we have a broken student. Those were easy times as educators, right? <laughs> so much easier to manage. Um, but yeah, we lost a lot of talent in that process because it was such a small mold that you had to fit into. But now in the past 20 years, sometimes we, we go overboard to the other side. Um, I've been in schools that um, parents would literally come in and you know, father is a lawyer and mother is an educational psychologist and they come in with a stack of books, you know, I know what this kid needs. And then it almost becomes a process of, you know, well, you know, if, if you're wealthy enough, you've got your staff, you've got your housekeeper, you've got your babysitter, you've got your teacher, and you need to manage them wisely. Um, but that's not like a good relationship to be in. And that's actually not supporting of a kid because a kid will um, change his attribution style. Maybe you know the sport, curling. Uh, curling means you, you have a disc, you push it over the ice, and then two people go ahead of it with a um, broom and really smoothen like the way. And that's what we're doing, like as education as parents, like the kid, we're gonna put him on the ice and we're gonna run in front of him and we're gonna use our brooms, like smoothen the entire way, and it works. The disc goes further. But the problem is, I don't know what your life looks like, but my life is full of obstacles actually huge obstacles. And why can I take these huge obstacles? Because I had small obstacles when I was a kid. And they got bigger and bigger and bigger and I got stronger and stronger and stronger. But the more we're doing this curling effect, going in ahead of our kid and taking all the challenges away, oh, you know, my kid was, he was frustrated in your class today, so now we need to have a new lesson. Well, that's not serving the kid necessarily. So what we want to do is have their attribution style in place. So when things go right, or when things go wrong, they should be attributing it the right way. So that gives you a couple of options. Say something goes wrong, I get a failing grade. I could say, oh no, I got a failing grade. You know, there's something wrong with me. Or I could say, well, I had a failing grade, but you know, what could I do? You know, my teacher didn't teach me individual spatial style that I prefer. Um, so now I'm placing the blame outside myself. And when I get a high grade, I can be like, yay, you know, I got a high grade, I'm so cool. Or I could say, you know, well, I couldn't help getting a high grade, I'm so lucky that the teacher made an easy test for me. And that creates four personality types, basically. Because the victim will always be kind of like at the whim of what happens. You know, high, high mark, easy test, low mark, bad test. And then you've got like a little bit more nuanced, two types, you've got the narcissist, will be every time he gets a high grade, like, you know, check me out, I'm cool. But every time he gets a low grade, he's like, that, that's not my fault. And then you've got the martyr who does exactly the opposite. Every time it goes right, she's like, oh, no. And often, unfortunately, it corresponds to he's and she's in very general terms. Um, what we want is whether you get a high or a low grade, you think, what can I do? What can I do to make things better? What can I do to improve things? So you should attribute it to yourself. So should we change the school or change <coughs> the student? The question should be, which one makes the student stronger? We should change the school to make the student stronger. And in many cases, that means making it harder for him because that will train him to become stronger. 
And that should be the process we're looking at. But we shouldn't like, take obstacles away to make it easier for them because that actually makes them weaker. So how can we prevent them getting stuck? Um, the biggest difference in getting learned helpless or not turns out to be your explanation style. And this is actually one of the things that um, kind of was wrong about Martin Seligman's learned helplessness theory. It turned out that there was always a group of dogs and a group of people that was immune to learned helplessness. So you could put them in situations that induce learned helplessness in most people, but they would be immune to it. Luckily for research, it wasn't enough to be significantly valid, um, but it still was interesting. And that's when he started to research what's the difference between the people who can almost not be made learned helpless and the ones that go there very easily, and it's explanation style. When something goes right or something goes wrong, when something, the optimist, the learned optimist, will explain it in terms of time to be temporary, in terms of scope to be specific, and in terms of source to be external. So what do you mean by that? Say we're playing a basketball game and I win. I'll say, you know, in the positive sense, where this is, uh, by the way, this is for negative um, events. For when I lose, I'll say it's temporary. I just lose this game. And the scope is only limited to basketball games on this court. And it's not my fault, you're having a good day. But the other way around, when I win, I'll be exactly the other way around. I'll be like, it's permanent. I always win. And I always win everything, pervasive. And why? Personal, because I'm cool. And an alert pessimist will do exactly the opposite. Whenever things go right, temporary, very specific, couldn't help, uh, that, that's my fault. So it's how you explain these things to yourself that makes a huge difference in how you deal with it. And this is also actually one of the ways you can solve it. Because this is one of the places where it's really cool that these kids are so smart. Because they're so smart, they can actually explain anything anyway. So you can give them an assignment. If he's naturally tending to be a learned pessimist, you can talk to him and say, well, can you write down for me the learned optimistic way of describing this event and the learned pessimistic way. And because that's a cognitive exercise, they can do it. But then you can have an interesting conversation and say which one is true. And if you really have a rational conversation, there is no way you can say that one is more true than the other. It's completely arbitrary. And that's the first step in recognizing that, hey, do you don't, and one of the ways I describe it to kids is don't believe what you think. <laughs> Because our mind is kind of like misguided sometimes. We've got all kinds of cognitive biases. So by learning about them, the chances are that we're better able to deal with them. So how do you train learned optimism? It starts with psychoeducation. Um, always important to note it's not psychoeducation, but it's psychoeducation. <laughs> it's learning about yourself, you know, teaching them this stuff. And they're smart. You can just really take out, you know, a psychology 101 course book. This is what learned helplessness is, because they understand that kind of stuff. Don't expect them to be able to apply it, though. That's a different thing. That's what they need our help for. Train the expl explanatory styles and be a role model. Because if you come in and you say, oh, I'm, you know, I'm, I, I suck at everything, and oh, I did something really stupid today, and I never can do anything right, how can you expect them to be optimistic? Um, display role models, people who had to deal with adversity. And include weird role models. That's actually one of the things that the students at our Gifted Dropout Center really appreciate. They say here, there's a lot of people who have like an alternative life, but they're doing really well and they're happy. Because in school, they just get like one, like this is the way your future is going to be. And like, I don't recognize that. I'm never going to fit into that. So that's not going to be my path. But now I've got like three or four different paths. Somebody went to study and is still studying. And somebody who never went to high school and still is doing well. Like, wow, there's all kinds of ways you can, you can design your future and still be OK. So how to counteract it? Psychoeducation again. Um, a safe, regulated environment. Training the explanatory styles. Um, the next is really technical, reinforce autonomous agency. Some of these kids will get really dependent. So only when all the things are set up in a proper way, they will be able to function. And they really need to train to do things on their own, however small the steps are. And um, that's really important to train that. So that's the next step in very, very small steps. Maureen Nyhart um, often says, you know, set a high challenge, but a low threshold, especially with kids that are twice exceptional, because they can't take the big leaps. But because their mind can go there, they want to know that they're working on something big, but then they need you to say, well, but the next step is going to be this, this, and that. 
If you work in robotics, you can, they, they can think of you know, designing a humanoid robot. Well, that's going to take about 20 years to get there. So if that's going to be your definition of success, it's going to be a lot of sad afternoons. But if we're going to say, cool, we're going to create a humanoid, what part are we going to do? We're going to create the vision, or we're going to create you know, something that can take steps. And then we're making it smaller, and that we can work on and have success in a month or a week or something like that. It's really important to do that in steps. So what we, what we do at Phoenix Talent, our guidance process goes through six steps. Um, it starts with recover and stabilize. Most of the kids have been home for about a year. It's actually for them a thing to come to us. Like the travel time of half an hour, like that's a big thing. Some actually have to start with one day or two days a week just to build up stamina of being out in the world again. So they're usually like in, in a living room setting with um, a psychotherapeutic counselor there to guide the process between the kids to make sure it's safe and that they can fall back on somebody. And this way they can stabilize. And then they can slowly go to the next step to activate. We've got a lot of studios. Um, we've got a place where they can build drones, where they can create clothes, where they can build, do woodworking. Um, we've got a big library, we've got all kinds of stuff. So whatever their interest is, they can try stuff out, do drama. But it's very, very free. Just come in for a session, just spend an hour there if you want to do it. If you're tired, then you can lay back a little bit. Um, but you do have to go somewhere. So we want you to move, but you don't have to commit to anything. But then after a while of doing that, we're going to take you to participation. You have to commit. And that's actually a big step for some students. You have to show up for six sessions, <coughs> six sessions in a row. And that's actually a big thing. Like if you're going to come to this drama class, you have to do all six. If you want to play with this drone, that's cool. But you have to spend at least six sessions building on it before you're allowed to do that. So step by step, you're building that up. And then they're going to look at learning and developing talent. By doing all these different things and participating in these different things, they learn that you know, learning from a book is not the only way of studying. There are a lot of different ways of doing that. So now they can take new steps and find out, hey, this is what I'm good at. This is what I can work with. And step by step, they can expand their kind of like vocabulary and their talents. So learn and develop your talents. Slowly start thinking, like, maybe I'm going to do woodworking. So let's build up a portfolio there. I'm going to do like photography. So I'm going to build up a portfolio there and maybe find a mentor or find somebody who's going to support me in that. And from there, I'm going to explore what are my possible future paths. So they'll actually go to a kitchen to work with a cook or actually go to like some multimedia media, uh, sound engineering course some of our students went to. So this way, they get different options of where they're going to go and eventually they fly out. Often they get coaching for a little while, while they're away. We're actually looking at now also, because some of the kids are like 17, 18, that they have a guided model of living on their own. Um, because they would used to just go live in rooms by themselves in the city. But that often creates a downward spiral of being alone. Like they're not able to structure their life properly to, to manage that. So to have somebody that they have dinner with every day, together with a group of about five kids, in a house, they live on their own, they've got their own space, that's fine. But every day they have to check in, have a short meeting or in this case dinner, together with somebody who just checks in and is like, oh, you seem to be all right. Or, hey, you seem to be calling in sick really often and you're looking a little bit pale and you don't look as happy. So do we need to do something to kind of get you going again? The last thing I kind of want to focus on is that one way of unintentionally inducing learned helplessness is having an incompatible guidance style with their self-regulation level. Again, a pretty technical term, but some kids are really good at regulating themselves. They're like, well, the coming month I'm going to work on this project, and then they spend three hours a day preparing for that, and they get there without anybody on their outside doing something. And then on the other hand, you've got somebody who really, really, really wants to do something, but it's not possible, he cannot spend more than two minutes preparing for it because he's distracted, he's doing something else, he's not able to look at it. And not as long as there's like external feedback or even punishment, will they get moving. And some kids will actually ask for it. Well, of course I didn't do my homework because you didn't say you would take away my cell phone if I wouldn't do it. Like they know that they're actually cognitively aware of their inability to regulate themselves. And High IQ does not automatically mean high self-regulation. If anything, there's actually a discussion that is the opposite, that the higher your IQ is, the lower your self-regulation is. Um, I record quite a number of trainings, and, and one is called, he's got an IQ of 145, but he cannot clean his own room. 
Like he's got like 200,000 views on YouTube or something because so many parents are like, yeah, that's my kid. Like it's not rocket science, you know, but so why isn't it working out? It's because like that self-regulation, that prefrontal part of the brain somehow didn't get into check really well. So how do you do that? Stage appropriate teaching and parenting. Um, like the elaborate version is like a training I do. It's like a year long training where you look at all the different developmental psychology theories from Kohlberg moral development to Lovinger's ego development. And like that, they all go through like eight or nine stages and then look at a kid and say, well, you know, cognitively he might be here, but in self-concept he's here, emotional development is here, self-regulation is here. And then you see that sometimes they have a really harmonic profile. I'm not going to do that to you tonight on Tuesday to have like all these theories come by. I'm going to simplify it to a very basic, um, basic out go. If you're going to look at the developmental lines, you've got like the cognitive line. So what can they think about? The ego development line. What's the way I'm looking at the world? What's the world like to me? Um, what are my needs? So what makes me happy? That actually develops through life. You get more sophisticated taste. Um, emotional development, moral development, and these go roughly to three phases. It starts pre-conventional. And to give an example is, uh, say for instance, I'm learning how to paint. When I'm learning how to paint, first I'm pre-conventional. I don't know how to do it. <laughs> I lack all technique, I don't know how to get started, I don't know what the techniques are, uh, I don't know how it's done. Then the second step is conventional. I'm going to take lessons, I learn the techniques, I learn the general approaches to doing this, and then if I'm really good, I spend a lot of time with it, at some point I'll be post-conventional. For instance, impressionists decided that maybe with points or squares or stuff like that, we can represent reality better than by actually painting reality. Uh, something like Picasso was really good at realistic paintings. He just thought, like, I've got a better way of showing reality than that realistic work that I've done. The challenge is um, that sometimes post-conventional can look a lot like pre-conventional. Uh, at some point at Sotheby's, like that's a British auction house, they sold off a painting made by a three-year-old for 60,000 um, pounds because some art critic had written an entire piece about the deeper layer of that <laughs> particular piece. Um, actually, the art critic had seen it, the kid hadn't. <laughs> um, so that's like the dip. Sometimes it's hard to see when it's pre-conventional or post-conventional. Actually, gifted kids are really good at exploiting that. For instance, doing your project. Doing your project, the conventional way is that your teacher hands you like a step-by-step -step approach that you're gonna go through the coming eight weeks and then you're gonna come with a re resolution. But then one of the kids comes to you and says, well, you know, I am post-conventional. I am hindered by all these step-by-step -step approaches. Uh, my creativity is, is squandered this way. So I want to have like a full autonomy to do it. So as a teacher, like, cool, you know, I've got a post-conventional kid, you go, man. And then you're gonna see if they're post-conventional. Because if they're post-conventional, they start the next day and they come up with something awesome and they check in with you once in a while. If they're pre-conventional and they were just thinking like, oh, this just looks like a lot of work, how can I get it away from this? Um, then they're gonna spend like the coming seven and a half weeks not doing anything and then three days before the deadline, they're like, ah! And then in three days they have to produce the end result. Unfortunately, often they get away with it thinking then that this is a good end result, that they actually did a good job. But so this is pre-conventional versus post-conventional. So that's what they call the pre-post fallacy. And actually also parents fall into this trap once in a while as well, that you're like, well, he's got a good story to go with it, so I'll go fight the teacher on this. But it's hard to see which one it is. And is there the disharmony between their cognitive level and their self-regulation level that gives challenges? The cognitive level, you can explain them everything, but you can't always assume that they can apply it. When I was teaching in classrooms, like with 16 gifted kids, and it would be like, you know, either chaos, or it'd be a fight on the playground, and you set them in a circle, you would get a brilliant analysis, like a play-by-play, step-by-step of everything that happened. And then they got a perfect analysis of what needed to be done. And then you'd send them out again, and three minutes later, they'd be back with exactly the same problem. So cognitively, they could understand something that they physically were not able to replicate, like in real life. So. How do you do that? If you're pre-conventional, then generally, if you look at self-regulation and your moral development, like one of the most telling sentences is, if I wasn't caught, I wasn't wrong. So like the example I just gave, got eight weeks for a project, if I'm gonna do it in the last two days, and if I get a passing grade, then that was a brilliant approach. 
whatever speech I'm going to get, like even if you're going to give me a sermon, the grade was passing, so therefore it's good. I was not caught. It's a bit of a risky combination with a high intelligence kid though, because they often don't get caught. They're too smart to get caught. And actually so the kids will be happy when they get into a gifted program, finally somebody catches me. I tried to get away with it and they wouldn't let me, and now I have to learn something. Now I can take steps. The conventional level is, what is the right way for our group? I will try to find out what your requirements are and I will try to live up to them. And if I live up to them, then I'll be fine. Um, this is one of the frustrations of a lot of high schools, because usually kids would come into high school at the conventional level. So you start high school with, these are the rules here, well, let's go. And then invariably one kid will put his hand up and says, what will happen if I don't follow the rules? And then the teacher's like, why would I explain that? Like, if I tell you what the rules are, you guys do it. But if they're still in the first level, if they don't know, you know what's going to happen if they get caught and if nobody's trying to catch them, then those rules are somebody else's preferences, apparently. But that doesn't mean anything for me. And the highest level is post-conventional. What gives the best result and what is fair? And the approach is different. Because a pre-conventional approach needs to have clear consequences. Whenever you do something that's not supposed to be done, there should be a consequence and somebody else should create that for you. At conventional level should be clear rules, positive feedbacks. You're being a good student because you're following the rules. Or, hmm, you're almost a good student, but you're missing these and these pieces. And the post-conventional approach is to discuss the end result and share empathy. I'm disappointed that you didn't make the end result. This is what we expected. And to expect somebody to regulate himself. The problem is that if you're at the pre-conventional level, you being sad doesn't mean a whole lot for me. That's nice for you that you're sad. I will just go on doing what I'm doing. And not because they're a bad person, but because they lack the theory of mind to actually have that emotional empathic quality to be able to change that way. And the big challenge as a parent and educator is that each of these levels thinks that it's the only way. This is the way the world works. And what we will do is we will teach our children, we will parent our children the way we are. So if our tendency is to discuss the end result and appeal to empathy, we will keep doing that, even though it might not serve the kid. And what I see is quite a number of gifted kids either being pre-conventional and being guided post-conventional or being post-conventional and being guided conventional. Those are the two biggest challenges. So what does that mean? It means that a kid is not able to self-regulate himself, is given full autonomy because, you know, we've read Tacey and Ryan, you know, they said kids need autonomy, especially gifted kids, and we're going to give it to them. Well, it's the difference between the desire for autonomy and the ability to deal with it. So they get all the autonomy and they just hear like, well, well, people are you know, disappointed with stuff. Well, they don't care. I wasn't caught, so I wasn't wrong. And the other one is, you know, a, get, get <coughs> a kid that actually is post-conventional, that has a brilliant project idea that, that could take eight weeks, but has to go through all the step-by-step -step processes where their plan is dead within the first two weeks because they had to jump to so many hoops. And the school system said, no, it has to be this and this way. So it's really about matching the style that you guide them with, with what you're doing for them. Try to slay the monster while it's little. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Like the, the earlier we can see these processes, the earlier we can train kids with, you know, not becoming learned helpless, but learned optimists, the easier it becomes to guide them. And well, just a more of a general overview, but I'm not gonna go too deeply into this. It's really looking at like, what is the appropriate way to guide this? Um, like, you know, basic identification, differentiation of content, that all schools should be able to do that. But it becomes more complicated when we really want to start teaching skills and especially guiding traumas and, and teaching better beliefs and life attitudes. And there are always places needed that, you know, gifted with special needs, how to support them. And then you really need to design a district in a way that all these meet, needs are met in like an economic, efficient way. And actually, you guys are really lucky because you're in a district that does that. Like a district that really tries to bring all that together at all the different levels. 
and that's actually that would be nice if a lot of places would do that because it's always this fight it should be you know this gifted school or it should be the classroom no it's not either or it's like the entire step by step all schools are doing this this is what we're doing in a pull-up program this is what we're doing in a full-time programs this is what we're doing in special educational needs and that entire framework that entire pyramid then starts really serving the needs of gifted kids in a realistic way and we have to keep improving that the better you get the more you know the more you know that you don't know and the more there is to improve and the more ambitious you get about what you want to achieve and i think we should keep doing that so um some of the things that i've been working on really closing off um, I'm really looking at how to support twice exceptional kids and make that as concrete as possible because there's so many regions where they're really underserved. There's like six schools in the entire world that, that are very specifically dedicated to this group. And I think there's a lot more, like every region has them, so how to support them. And create a model to look at like where is it coming from? Is it a brain physiological thing or is it a belief thing or is it a lack of skills? because it's really thrown on one heap, but often it's misdiagnosis and trying to find out which one it is and how to support that. I'm um, looking at that asynchronous development, having a really elaborate view of a kid, like what's this cognitive development, emotional development, moral development, to have like the appropriate approach. A bright future for our bright minds. The world is changing. We're gonna have artificial intelligence like invading schools pretty soon. It's not gonna take longer than 10 years, but virtually nobody's doing anything with it. So are we gonna design it or are gonna the Googles and the Facebooks of the world gonna design it? And I'd rather have education take a big step in that and actually be on the forefront of that as opposed to hoping it will turn out all right. So that's the next book I'm writing together with James Webb. I'm really excited about that. The School of Understanding is where I'm trying to apply all these things in practice. I'm the principal and the board member and founding board member there to see like how far can you push education um, if you don't have like a board that you need to be held accountable to in a traditional sense. Um, we're a charter school, so we've got some freedom there, non-profit. Um, yeah, see what we can do and build software to support that because if you start doing stuff like uh, portfolio learning, which is what most especially gifted programs end up going to, it becomes really time consuming to have all the registration and stuff like that. So see what we can do with software to, to support that. Um, yeah, so if I can do anything for you, I've recorded a number of trainings, like you were at the one I did at the California Association for the Gifted. I did one at Davidson in Reno, about seven challenges of gifted kids. Uh, at CAG I did the bright future for our bright minds. I'll put it all together in a package and I'll send it so you can put it on the website so you can look at all the different presentations. And if you like them, you can also forward them to other people who unfortunately couldn't be here today. Um, because this really for me is about sh sharing the world. It's really about like these kids need help and all the practical tools we can bring into the world and that we can work together on like that. That is just valuable. So if you find that material valuable, please forward it to other people. And if there are schools that are willing to work with this or want to do stuff with it, I'm happy. I'll probably be coming back in November and February to work with schools in the Bay Area and LA. And I'd love to come back here as well to see what we can do there. And then I want to thank you so much for uh, listening to me rambling for an hour. <laughs> thank you so much.